All right, go ahead and get rolling since we're three minutes past the hour. Um, so thanks to everyone for being here this morning um, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Mulder, Program Director at the Family Online Safety Institute. And we're really glad to be hosting today's webinar, which is the latest in our series of discussions on all things digital parenting. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at some of the different elements of gaming and how all of the vast changes in lifestyle during this first half of 2020 have contributed to a lot of different perspectives on gaming, um, not just around the amount of time being spent, but also what types of challenges and benefits that games are bringing to areas like social connection, relationship building, resilience in kids, <clears throat> and just overall impacts <clears throat> excuse me, on the dynamic around technology use at home as families are learning how to balance all of the change in the world around us. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm very thrilled to hand over to today's facilitator, who is a leading expert in the digital parenting space, a top advisor to industry and international institutions, and a very good longtime friend of ours here at FOSI, Dr. Elizabeth Milobidov. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here um, with like two of my favorites, Roblox and of course, Ask the Mediatrician. Um, <laughs> but before we get started, uh, I'm just going to say that I am a mom with uh, two little boys. They're 10 and 13, so I completely understand what uh, the parents are going through. Um, I also am, a, I run a, a Facebook group called the Digital Parenting Community, where we have lots of parents in there asking some questions. And this is where I've sourced questions for you, Dr. Michael, and for you, Laura. Uh, because the parents were really excited. Um, and so I will not say anything more about me because I think you can read about uh, all of that in the, when you guys signed up. But if I can do a brief introduction to Laura, who's the Director of Community Safety and Digital Civility at Roblox, also a longtime friend of mine. So it's a lot of fun to be able to share the the, the stage. Um, and Dr. Michael Rich, who I already said, he's the face behind Ask the Mediatrician, uh, which is the leading resource for digital parenting questions through the Center on Media and Child Health, um, out of, um, which is part of the Boston's Children's Hospital. So if I forgot anything that you guys think is really, really important, I will let you bring it up when you do your own little uh, parts. So without wasting any more time with introductions. Laura, tell us some fabulous things about Roblox. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and yes, like you, I'm delighted to be here today. So thanks, uh, Fozy, for facilitating it. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, Roblox is um, one of the most popular platforms for kids around the world right now. Um, we are a platform for imagination. So kids can create games, they can play games, they can socialize. Um, we, we can stream ed, um, entertainment in there, you know, we're a one-stop shop and I think what's been fascinating is how that's been used through the lockdown period um, and through COVID-19. Um, so we currently have around 120 million monthly users on the platform and growing. Um, they range in age um, right up from kind of eight, nine and ten right up through to teenagers and they tend to use the platform for different things. Um, um, and they have their own communities within that. And some of that I hope will come out through our, through our conversation today. Um, we'll just different things, different things like what? That's just so exciting. Yes, so the younger ones tend to come on and it's quite often their first experience of a games platform or being able to play games. Um, and we have millions of different experiences. So there is something for every type of family and every child. Some of them are those really traditional beginning, middle, end games, role playing games. We have, you know, um, obstacle courses that they have to race through. And then we have competitive games. So there really is something for everyone. The older ones tend to use it much more for socialising. Um, and, and we're going to talk a lot about those kind of really solid online friendships that they build, but also the development of games. So we have um, a huge raft of resources for both educators and for players and, and families um, about the basic coding, building of games, game design, right through to really technical stuff. And actually, every game on Roblox has been created by the young developers themselves. So we, we see some real talent. <laughs> um, so my role um, around digital civility, I'm really lucky um, in that I get to hear from the community and work with the community. So I, whether that's educators, whether it's people with a duty of care for children, whether it's parents and caregivers, or the kids themselves. Um, and I do get down and dirty. I, I meet and talk with them and hang out in their communities because for us, it's really important that we hear what's really going on for them. You know, we talk a lot about safety. And of course, as a platform for design for kids, safety has to be our number one 
um, priority and it is and we put those tools in place um, but it, there's more than that we have this opportunity we're working with millions and millions of young people every day we can learn from them but we also need to understand that apart from this uh, obvious safeguards we need to protect them from you know exploitation from harassment those big things but actually try to listen and understand the other stuff that's important to them and trying to be responsive to that I think is the key to a really healthy community and what we're trying to do with, with the civility program at Roblox is to help kids get these life skills they're essential through play it's essential through their growing up and learning that we can turn them into digital skills but they will use them offline they will use them on other platforms so things like building that empathy and kindness and teamwork and you know the the work ethics and all of those skills that they need to be able to play and finish a game but actually help them with that community and that socializing aspect Right. I love so much that you're talking about um, listening to the children because that's something that I tell all of the parents in my digital parenting community is to have conversations with your children. Talk to them, find out what they're doing and how they're playing and, and, and you'll be able to see a lot more. So I just love that, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. And so one of those initiatives we do is that we regularly carry out surveys within our community. So I think this is now the fourth one that we've done um, in, in, since, since I started the role. Um, but this one, um, so we did one back in March where we were looking generally about teens' experience of online and parents as well and how they might differ. We then did a different one this time. Everything changed at the beginning of COVID-19. Our whole world turned upside down for us and for kids. So we wanted to really find out from them what had changed. Now, we didn't quite repeat the same questions, but we just wanted a snapshot of how they felt things were. So I have just a couple of quick slides yes, yes. Um, and then hopefully we can talk a bit more. So interesting stuff so we had nearly 3,000 respondents um, aged between 13 and 18 from all over the world um, as you can see here so um, just over half of them were still using Roblox or, or other platforms as a way to hang out with their in real life friends no surprise they're not able to get together face to face so they're using technology as a way to still maintain those friendships and then 40% of them said that it actually improved their friendships which I thought was really fascinating yeah that's really sweet um, uh, yeah, so next slide. We, we'll dig into some of this in a bit more detail. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that was growing, of course, was building new online relationships. And they said these were really, really important to them. Um, and I think this is because, you know, when you're thrown together with school friends, you're there in a class because you live in the same area. You become friends, you form friends. Um, but it's because of different reasons. Um, what we're finding now is people who are drawn together online have the really specific interests that are the same. And so they're building these really strong relationships with a shared common interest. Um, but also some of these things that were helpful to them, like less stress about appearance and feeling like they had to look a certain way to fit in, that took the pressure off them. It was easy to make friends because they had those common interests. And they felt it was a safe space for them to explore conversations that they perhaps might find a bit more challenging face to face. So they were talking about their fears and anxieties about the current situation with COVID-19, for example. Um, interesting, with building friendships online, uh, one in five of them told us their parents had actually relaxed about who they were talking to online. And it was a positive, you know, they previously, parents were very anxious about, you know, not talking to anyone that they didn't know in real life. But of course, that's not possible now. Um, just quickly onto another couple of slides and hopefully we can talk more in a while. Thank you. So. What was also lovely is that kids were using this opportunity, much like us adults who were learning to knit or doing yoga or making sourdough bread, the kids <laughs> do the same thing online. So they're using yes. time not just to make new friends, but to have new experiences. They're trying out different types of games and they're building and creating and taking up some of those more educational things, but by themselves, not because they're being told to. Right. And then just the final one, thank you. Um, so this is actually from the previous um, study that we did, which was um, four and a half thousand teenagers. Um, and they were reflecting that 65% of them told us that their parents at some point had got angry and confiscated their tech or turned off the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Most of them rightfully were like, yeah, okay, I was a bit annoyed, but I can understand why. But interestingly, those words hopelessly betrayed, they're really strong feelings that these kids had where they felt their parents had done something really wrong and unjustified to them. And it built kind of 
some of the um, video responses that we had, these kids were really deeply affected by it and it really damaged the trust and relationship between them and parents. Now, it would be really interesting to see if we're able to repeat this, whether parents would still take those same actions now when we're also reliant on, on tech as a way of communicating. So yeah. I'll leave that there for now and hopefully we can touch on some of this a bit later. May I, may I ask a question, Laura? Um, and this last slide, um, were they offered positive options? Uh, yeah, absolutely, they were. So I could understand why. I'll share that, actually. I'll share that. We can send that particular survey back out as well. But yes, yeah, so it had a full range of how did it make you feel? What, you know, did you actually feel supported by your parents? Was it a right thing for them to do right through to these more negative? Unsurprisingly, it swayed heavily towards the negative. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. Although I have found that some kids... Um, are sort of relieved when their parents restrict them because they feel the pressure from their peers to be on and yeah. and they and they really want to go to sleep or they really want to do something else absolutely yeah. this you know. wasn't in the context of a that sort of time management thing this was a literal taking away of um, as opposed to a managed approach and I think you know we we certainly would advise against this sometimes an intervention is needed we do understand that um, but actually, I think adults now are starting to understand how important screens are, devices are, being able to stay in touch. You know, all of our screen time has gone up, and I think parents might understand that a little bit better now. Yeah, and I was just going to say, Laura, what I think is fascinating is that um, you looked at teens. And so really, you know, the 13 to 19 who are using their devices for social networking, and those are their social connections. And so if you restrict and cut it all down, I kind of understand that hopeless and betrayed because it's like taking away that princess line telephone that I used to have when I was a teenager. I mean, you are cut off of, of everything. Um, so that's really interesting. So thank you. And so then we're, we're finished with your the presentation. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to head over to um, Dr. Rich, please. Would you please share with us um, some of the goodies and the fun things that you're up to um, over there in the United States? Oh, yes. Well, um, thank you for having me. Um, uh, I love my friends and colleagues at Roblox because they are um, one of the tech companies that has been very open to um, really developing a dialogue around this and not getting into a defensive stance, um, which, quite frankly, the history has been that when people express concerns about kids online, um, there, there's sort of uh, the typical response is it's not my problem, it's someone else's. Um, and, and sometimes it's not my problem, it's the parents. Um, but Roblox is, has been very constructive in this way um, and, and really op opened up the dialogue and recognized that in fact, um, the interactive media space, whether it be games, whether it be social media, anything you can do either online or with a company, um, is part of the environment in which kids are growing up today. And, and it uh, is influenced by them and it certainly influences their development in positive as well as negative ways. Um, and so the Center on Media and Child Health was founded back in 2002, actually, when the issue really was television, believe it or not. Um, um, and from the uh, concern that that while there was a lot of advocacy in this space, a lot of sort of opinions being thrown around, it's not good for kids, this, that, and the other, um, it was very polarized. You were either for kids or you were for screens, but you couldn't be for both. And uh, as a refugee from the film industry, I was a screenwriter for 12 years before I had a midlife crisis that drove me to medical school, um, that, um, I, you know, I, I recognize the fact that you know, what is being put on screens and, and device makers are not seeking to harm, and yet they were, believe, they were being beaten up for harming kids. And I said, this is not, this is, first of all, this is not um, in, you know, in sync with what's going on in the world. I mean, the kids live in a digital environment now, and even more so um, since COVID-19, in, in the sense where we, um, basically have to transact all everything in life from buying groceries to learning at school to doing our jobs to socializing um, and communicating um, and so our goal was to bring the same level of rigorous science that we bring to say nutrition or to um, injury prevention um, to understand how we are changed by the media we use and how we use them 
and use that knowledge to direct these changes in the positive way um, and be able to mindfully avoid potential. Um, and, and so building on that foundation, if you will, of evidence, um, uh, we have put together everything from a, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, Elizabeth, um, Ask the Mediatrician, which is an online advice column where parents ask me questions that range from at what age should I get my kid a smartphone to um, uh, how do I get my 10 year old son to quit singing Viva Viagra in the supermarket? And, and so <laughs> we get from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, we answer them all with a straight face and based on the science, um, uh, we acknowledge what we know and what we don't know. Um, uh, and so one of the big um, efforts at the Center on Media and Child Health is uh, research. And we're doing a lot of research, including um, uh, the project uh, Growing Up Digital, which is now global, um, or we call it GUD or good, so global good. Um, and we have um, research sites in um, Alberta, Canada, in uh, Australia. We're about to launch one in Silicon Valley and uh, in the early stages of discussing a European arm as well. And the goal with this is actually to um, understand that while the digital environment is global, um, that different cultures and different societies, different countries are managing it in very different ways, both in the macro sense of uh, laws and restrictions, but also in the micro sense of parents and kids and what's yeah. happening in homes. And um, what we've discovered, even from the earliest phases of this, is that um, there are real um, uh, strengths and vulnerabilities that are cultural in nature. Um, the culture that, that is, you are using these same tools. The cultures find uh, better things. What, for one example, um, what we found is that in the US, uh, not surprisingly, the more screen time kids had, the less time um, they actually played in, you know, in physical non-digital non ways. In Mexico, the more screen time they had, the more they played. Um, so what this might be, in fact, is a cultural preconception in the U.S. that screens are the enemy of play. Um, right. and, and so right. what, there, there, we're getting some really interesting feedback. Um, we're get, you know, and of course, each site not only has sort of the standard study, but they also add on their own um, right. in, in concerns. And in, in Canada, for example, um, we're finding really microcultures that have protective things. They have a lot of indigenous people in, in Alberta um, and um, those communities um, use me very ways and um, we're learning a lot from it. And this is a way of crowdsourcing how best to live in a digital environment and, and learning from and teaching each other. Um, and actually, one of the things um, that has flowed out of this um, and was really accelerated by uh, the COVID-19 lockdown is um, something we're calling the Family Digital Wellness Guide. Um, mm -hmm. I, will, I will share my screen to uh, show it to everyone now, but that is um, reachable through our website at cmch.tv. Um, and what it is, uh, frankly, is... Um, essentially it's attempting to be Dr. Spock, for those of you who remember Dr. Spock's baby and child care, um, yeah. for the digital age. And what it does is it follows the child through each developmental stage, from infancy through adolescence. Um, it talks, it's too long, you don't have to read it, and there will be that words. But in, in very brief ways, it talks about what's happening developmentally for the child, how that developmental stage and those developmental tasks interact with the digital environment. Um, and then a series of focused tips, if you will, pro tips um, that look at different aspects of, you know, for example, how should an infant um, use interactive media? And, you know, talking about um, doing video calls with grandparents and, and things of that nature. Um, uh, right through to adolescence. And it also has um, what we're calling icebreakers, which is how do you talk to kids um, who maybe, you know, 
on the defensive right from the get-go about, say, video gaming or, or social media or cyberbullying. Um, because what we really believe, and to echo what Laura said earlier, is that um, we've got to move out of the environment or the, the assumption that parents are there to police their children online. Um, I, I don't even, I, I get into arguments with tech people all the time tr who are trying to do uh, the right thing by putting parental controls in. And I'm saying, hey, dude, <laughs> no kid on the face of the earth wants to be controlled by their parents. Let's shift this to parental engagement. Let's encourage parents to game with their kids, you know, to talk about them and to interact with them, not in a way of, oh my God, I can't believe you're playing Grand Theft Auto. You know, you're a terrible human being. Um, <laughs> but, but the interesting thing, thing that happens when, kid, when adults play with their kids is first of all, um, the roles are reversed. Um, the parent is the student. The, chi the child is the teacher. And you are space with respect and concern and love for them to understand what's going on. Um, you're not coming in to wag a finger at them. Um, and, and so um, it, what's really important about that is that then after you finally figure out how to steal cars in Grand Theft Auto, you actually can talk to your kid a little bit about why you might want to practice this over and over and over and over again. Um, and, and help shift them to more productive, more pro-social uh, activities. Um, and, and I will say one other thing before we, we sort of open up for discussion. I, I, I think one of the controversial things you will find in um, the Digital Wellness Guide and actually in all of our material, there's a lot more material on our website, um, is that screen time as a concept and screen time limits are obsolete. Um, and because the technology is such that screens are around us all the time. Um, and frankly, I study the stuff and I couldn't tell you how much screen time I spent yesterday um, or the day before or on average. Because we move seamlessly in and out of screen environments um, and we use them in a variety of ways. It's not like sitting on the couch and watching a TV show anymore. Um, and, and so what's more important than screen time is what you're doing with the screen. Um, so it's content and it's context. The, what, the content you're interacting with and the context in which you're doing it. So, um, you know, you don't play games at the dinner table or, you know, into, into the wee hours of the night. Um, uh, we, it, it's not the game that's the problem, it's the behavior that's the problem. And, and, and what we need to recognize is that we should use these very powerful tools in mindful, focused, and directed ways. And also understand that they're not always the best tool for the job. And it's okay to turn it off and take a walk or throw a ball around the backyard. And so while screen time limits are obsolete, limiting screen time is not. And the way you do that is, what am I not doing because I'm doing this? And would that be more interesting, better exercise, more fun? Um, and um, I, I think one of the, the good outcomes, believe it or not, out of uh, the lockdown for COVID-19 is that kids who used to see the interactive space purely as a playground, have learned to use it as a place of learning, a place of communicating, a place of connecting with people. And frankly, after you know two or three Zoom classes a day, they want to turn the thing off, yes. right? And so yes. they're actually getting on it instead of it being their you know, escape. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to the group with, with that, but I encourage everyone to um, check out and use the Family Digital Wellness Guide and give us feedback because if there are situations you have faced that, um, that it doesn't cover, we want to know that and we can respond to it. Okay, I know that Laura had a, had a quick uh, something to mention before we get into the general discussion. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on Michael's points and this is why we're always so well aligned in this area. So <laughs> On the survey, again, uh, we asked the young people, like, how's your screen time gone up? We can make big assumptions, but we wanted to know. So 66% of them said, yep, screen time has increased. 
And to your point, you know, you were saying young people are now using that screen time in much different ways. I think adults are too, and they're starting to understand when their kids are playing a game like Roblox, they're not just playing a game. They are chatting with their friends, they are creating an outfit, they're dressing up, they're, you know, building a game. There's so many different things. And I think parents are getting much more insight into that side of things as well, uh, which, is, which is wonderful. Um, and you were talking about parental engagement and you know we're, we're huge advocates of that. Um, and I'm sure that's gonna come up as a common theme throughout this discussion. Exactly. When we did the previous survey, 69% uh, of the kids said they wanted their parents more involved in their online life, which surprised us at the time. I think it's specific areas of their online life might be probably more true. <laughs> now we've repeated that question and over a third of parents are now more involved in a positive way. So this isn't the putting a monitoring app on a phone. This is physically sitting down, having a conversation. What are you doing? Who are you doing it with? Let's play games together. So it's the message is getting there but I think it's slightly forced because of the current situation. And what we need to keep doing is saying how good this is and how, how, how good you feel as a family and how well this is working for you, let's carry on when lockdown lifts because you can see the, you know, how well it's worked for you. Yeah, what lockdown has served as is an accelerant um, uh, yep. of trends that were already happening, um, but it sort of forced these, these trends. Um, and um, the thing I was most concerned about was, will it also accelerate the trends toward, you know, compulsive use um, in, and uh, what some have called addiction, which we do not find to be an addiction, but in fact, actually to be a syndrome of behaviors that show underlying issues. Um, but that being said, I think what's, what's really important here is that we really think about using these tools mindfully and being aware, self-aware through this, um, because we're dealing with three moving targets here. We're the developing human being from infancy, adolescence to adulthood. The rapidly evolving digital environment in which that development is occurring. And the third is the behaviors all of us have transformed because we have smartphones in our pockets and, and you know, smart watches on our wrists and screens all around us. Um, and interestingly, uh, to your point, one of the questions I always ask my patients when their parents are out of the room, you know, you'll get my subversiveness here, is <laughs> what could your parents do better? Yeah. And I would say at least two thirds uh, of them, the first thing out of their mouth is pay more attention to me you know, be with me more. Um, and that would include their online life as well as, as, as their offline life. Um, and, and interestingly, when um, Fortnite, you know, kind of hit like a tsunami around the world and parents were freaking out, oh my God, it's Hunger Games online and they're, you know, killing each other. I was asking my patients uh, who played Fortnite um, what, what the experience was for them. They don't talk about gaming. They don't talk about winning. They don't talk about shooting. They talk about hanging out with their friends, you know? And it's, it's, it's like what Sandlot baseball was, right? You know, is go to the neighborhood, you know, vacant lot with a bat and a ball and you play baseball, but they're not thinking about becoming major league baseball players. They're arguing about, was I out or was I safe? They're, you know, deciding who's on whose team. It's all social emotional work. It's building a society and building themselves as citizens. Um, and I think that that is what's going on in a lot of the, in, in Minecraft and Roblox and, and Fortnite, which is it's really a way of interacting with a larger world, which is part of development. Yeah, and that's exactly what they're supposed to be doing. But I think what's really interesting is that uh, all three of us um, are just very, um, very, very into parental engagement, obviously. Um, and I think that that is such a key. Um, I'm going to say, um, Michael, that uh, your guide, I'm going to check it out. And you let us know if we can translate it into French. Huh? Because, oh, please. You know, oh, please. Uh, this is available. We've already had it translated into Espanol. Spanish. I saw um, that. And um, we are actually talking about uh, translating it into Mandarin Chinese as well. Oh, fantastic, yeah. So okay. if, you're, if you're ready to get to it, let's get to it. Yeah, you know, my Russian's really bad, but we'll talk about that too. So, <laughs> so get your husband to do it. 
<laughs> yeah, I won't tell him that. Um, so <laughs> listen, you guys, let's go ahead and um, have a little bit more of the discussion because I do have uh, some questions that were also in my digital parenting community, um, as well as just some other questions. Because I really appreciate hearing about the family well-being guide and hearing about the the survey from Roblox and just seeing how you know everybody is is really concerned with. Uh, this well-being, well-being of our children, well-being of families, because let's face it, you know, the pandemic just hit like a tsunami, as we've heard. And um, I agree with Michael in that, in a way, I mean, this has just been a fabulous benefit uh, that children are sitting next to their parents while the parents are on a Zoom call or what have you working and the children are gaming. And so parents are also able to see a little bit of what's going on. Um, so for me, those types of benefits, those are some of the good things that I hope that um, parents continue once, you know, everybody starts easing out of lockdown and then getting rid of some of the, the bad habits, which I think is going to bring me to um, one of my very first questions for you is that, um, and I'm going to actually, Laura, I'm going to ask this question to you because you were talking about you know just your gaming community and so we've seen some discussion about the difference between social distancing and physical distancing so what kind of examples have you seen in the gaming community um that's you know su people supporting each other during the quarantine so i'm really pleased that you've raised that topic for me the second we heard social distancing i panicked um mm. for some people you know particularly i mean i have friends who live alone in London, a long way from anyone, and actually just being locked in a flat <laughs> um, can be really isolating. So, you know, this whole idea, it's physical distancing in the real world, but actually we need to socialize even more when we can't have those human interactions as regularly as we did before. So it's really good. And I'm glad that the World Health Organization picked that up. And I'm amazed that that wasn't more widely adopted. It kind of, it fizzled. So it's really good that we keep reminding people, this is physical distancing, not social. and, and bringing families together, you know, being able to have that cross-generational thing. So having grandparents being able to speak to the grandchildren and, and those sorts of relationships are absolutely essential. So um, that, that's one thing. I think particularly within Roblox, we were already in the movement towards this whole social space. You know, we talk about the metaverse, you may have heard that term, but it's the idea of, you know, we're, we're, we're a city where everything can happen. So it is entertainment, it, it is creativity, it is education, it is fun, it's play, it's all of these things. Um, so um, when, when the um, Stay At Home co uh, Together concert was, was on, we were really lucky that we were asked to stream it. So we had this incredible event right at the beginning of lockdown where um, we had thousands and thousands and thousands of young people congregating inside an auditorium, inside Roblox, where they could play little mini games and they were sort of being themselves as their avatars, being able to chat, text, text chat with their friends and watch the concert in real time at the same time. I mean, it was just such a wonderful thing to be a part of. And the kids absolutely embraced it and loved it. And so, you know, we, we're very keen to make sure we're continuing with those kind of entertainment things, but keeping that social aspect. Um, we're seeing, you know, things like we, we introduced a lot more private servers. So kids who, for example, couldn't have birthday parties, in real life were able to have a safe private space where they and their friends could get together hang out play some games and chat in a very secure environment which of course for the really young ones is is ideal um, and then for the older ones we're seeing things like graduations happening in roblox um, which which that's been absolutely amazing so we're, we're really pleased that we've been able to offer a place where people can safely congregate and still have fun you know we are <laughs> that's the whole essence of roblox it's a fun place so this is different than just going on, you know, a chat app and talking to people. It's that whole, the fact you can do so many different things in there. It's really interactive as well. So, um, yeah, I think for us, we, we really feel that we've kind of provided a service that was very well needed for our community. Um, and just generally, the interesting feedback we had that was another change was the behaviour change of other Roblox users. So a lot of young people were feeding back that people were being more patient, more helpful, more kind. And that really resonated with me about how young people were recognizing that. And I think adults have a lot they could learn from that. <laughs> For <laughs> um, sure. About how they're conducting themselves online through COVID. 
Yes, I have to admit, I've played Fortnite with my son and I'm, and I'm not the greatest, but he will, you know, try to help me along and, and you know, give me strategies. He'll come back with, you know, potions and things. So uh, I, I, I agree that our children are learning some empathy along the way. Um, I'm going to switch over to Michael because um, I really have the super pediatrician question for you. So take off the screenwriting hat, please. Uh, although I, we were talking about pandemic, I'm sure you saw the movie. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about screen time, and I agree with you as far as looking at, um, you know, the content and, and, and quality of what they're doing online and not trying to find, you know, an hour a day and find a rule. But now, one of the things that I'm hearing a lot from parents as we're heading into the new normal is that they are kind of freaking out because their children have been online for so much. And, and I agree with you that while some kids are saying, oh gosh, do I have to go online again? Is it another Zoom call? Is it a class? I don't even want to look at my iPad. There are others who are just out there, you know, happy, happy, happy as can be. And I have two of them in the other room uh, who are just, you know, thrilled to be online. So if you could address, you know, this idea of this new normal, and then also um, as, as our children are going back in fall, and so let's just, you know, call the summer as it is, where we're going to try to fix things and put strategies into place. What is it that parents can really do to get their children ready for September, assuming that they are going to be back in school and back on that schedule before? Pediatrician hat, not screenwriter. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, no, I, it, this has been a concern really since the lockdown began, and that is that what we need to do, first of all, is keep a schedule, um, not, not just to prepare them for getting up in time for school in the fall, which they may or may not have to do, given, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of variables and, and, and they're going to be different in different regions. Right. Um, but that being said, what a schedule does is a couple of things. Number one is that it preserves their sleep time, which is absolutely essential. Um, it, you know, they, they need a day night or circadian rhythm um, and need to keep it. They need to get enough sleep, particularly, um, interestingly, teenagers who need more sleep than they needed when they were younger because they're in the second most rapid growth spurt in their life after uh, immediate, uh, immediately after birth is your fastest. But if you think about it, I'm sure you've got a 13 year old, I'm sure you turn around and say, Oh my God, you're two inches taller. You know, how did that happen? You know, exactly. um, and I'm and, six one, so you can imagine when he's spurting right. up the, yeah. something to right. notice. <laughs> you get, just, just get ready. He may be taller than you, but you always have heels. <laughs> Okay. Uh, but um, that, that's really important. But actually what, it, what it's important for in the big sense is security, is making them feel needed, accountable, and um, like they have um, a, a purpose. Um, interestingly, when the kids who, you know, sort of threw out all schedules and slept until the middle of the afternoon and then stayed up all night and this, that, and the other, there's a huge amount of anxiety that is produced by that, by not having a schedule, not having a structure. And a lot of kids have felt quite unmoored in this time because no one is demanding anything of them. And in fact, um, while the schools um, tried their best to be kind to the kids by saying, oh, these Zoom lectures are optional or this is pass fail, what the kids heard was, you don't care what I do. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. And so even the motivated students kind of kicked back and said, well, the kids who are doing nothing are going to get the same grade I'm going to get. Why should I bother? And it actually created a lot of anxiety and stress in the kids. So I think the most important thing we can do is uh, establish a, a schedule and stick to it. And I usually recommend to my patients that they actually write it down and stick it on the refrigerator or something so that they're not these arguments of, you said you'd go to bed at this time. No, I didn't. I said, just put that aside. I think the other thing that's important is that rather than clamping down and restricting their screen time is to develop alternative activities that are as much or more fun. Um, particularly ones that get their physical yayas out, you know, yeah. that just get you know, out there. So, um, you know, you look at the things that attract them to say gaming. Um, it's, subversive. it's a little bit something that mom and dad are a little worried about. Um, I've had kids who have taken to things like parkour, 
um, because it's very similar, you know, and parkour being the gymnastics of the urban environment sort of thing. Um, and, um, and, and so to be a little creative with your kids, thinking about other things to do, um, because even the most hardcore gamers get bored after a while, you know, because these are, you know, standardized algorithms um, right. and that, you know, there's only so much, so much variation. And the goal in many cases is how to game the system. But once you've gamed the system, there's yeah. not much there of interest anymore. Um, so I, I think that that would be my two key things, you know, which is schedule and putting in that the right amount of sleep and three square meals a day instead of grazing all day long. Um, Oops. And, nope. and then, <laughs> um, I, I'm not calling you out, don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying, that, that I think that particularly for a growing child who is not just physically growing, but socially and emotionally and, and yes. psychologically growing as well. Yes, I 100% agree. So thank you. All I can say is that I will have difficulty translating uh, gaming yayas into French and Russian, but I will give it a try. Um. I'm, sure that, I'm sure there's an equivalent because human nature being what it is, um, you know, I, I'll give you lots of elbow room on, on getting your yayas out. <laughs> Okay, and so now I have another question for both of you. Um, and so kind of along the same line, so because during this time, you know, families have been uh, at home, they've been spending so much more time together. Um, so this is more about, um, you know, your viewpoint on the parents and how the parents can be a good, um, and I hate saying good, but a digital role model. Um, what, what do you guys both think and see about that and what type of advice would you give to parents? Um, I'll start with you, Laura. Go for it, Laura. Okay. So, um, as I say, some of this was reflected directly from the kids. You know, they wanted their parents more involved, and they are, and that's wonderful. So, we um, there was a lovely quote in a, in a news article uh, recently where um, Dad had obviously just started kind of going, "Oh, okay, what do you normally do when you're online? Show me." And they spent time, and, and the kid just said, "You know, spending time with me on Roblox is my most favourite thing to do in the whole world." And of course, Dad just immediately melted because that's what we all want to hear. And he just yeah. had always thought of Roblox as what these kids did somewhere else. Um, so I think those sorts of things are fantastic. As you described, there's that scenario now where you've got parents on one end of the table and kids on the other, and even if they're doing different things, we know kids pick up everything. Right. And I think parents didn't used to really realise that until now they're getting called out on everything. You know, if they cuss, the kids hear it. <laughs> if they're getting annoyed, the kids are like, you tell me not to do that. Um, and actually I think it's correcting some of that behaviour. It's a two-way street. Um, so I think that's been a real positive that's come out of it. And as you say, some of the actual digital literacy stuff, they are learning how to use different apps and websites and things that they probably wouldn't have had to do before. And it's coming much more naturally. Um, so, yeah, I think parents are doing a lot better. We still need to do more. We still need to carry on, you know, from the learning that we have now. But, but it's a really positive step in the right direction. That's fantastic. And you, Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that what we're hopefully moving away from is the double standard where, um, you know, the parent says, get off that video game, I hate it, it's bad for you, while busy, you know, um, snap snapping a snapchatting pictures of the menu they made or uh, an email with the boss so that there's this sense that what i'm doing is important and what you're doing is not important um and and so i think it's really important for parents to recognize the fact that kids listen to me one percent of what we say to them but they hear a hundred percent of what we do and so what we are not only um, talking to them about it, but we are modeling, we are constantly modeling behavior. And no matter how sullen and nonverbal your teenager may be, you are still the most important um, if, you know, uh, influence on his or her life. Um, and um, they're watching us all the time. And, and this does go back to this issue of them saying, pay more attention to me, because sometimes parents are just staring at their smartphones uh, in um, and research that, uh, that colleagues of ours did, um, they found that um, over half of the parents um, were distracted in conversations with their children, and mm -hmm. over three quarters of the kids were um, distracted. And both of them were calling the other out, basically. Right. Um, so we have, for some reason, um, just 
defaulted to the smartphone as the most important thing. Um, when we have a young person right there in front of us who is not going to be this age forever, um, and we're missing out. Um, and so I think that um, it's really important for parents to uh, both model good behavior, but also to structure good behavior um, for themselves and for each other. And what I mean by that is not rules, but expectations. Um, Rules are made to be broken by kids, right? I mean, and, and one of the dangers of having rules and particularly around um, the internet um, is that the internet can become rock and roll for kids. You know, I like it more because mom and dad don't understand it and hate it, right? And, and we don't want that to happen. This is, this is, you know, the village square of the 20th century. This is the, the place that they need to be adept, not just in terms of learning and communicating, but in terms of socializing and interacting. And so what we need to do is remember, first of all, remember why we had kids in the first place, right? Because we wanted to meet these unique individuals and get to know them and guide them and help them and support them. Um, we weren't born to be their police officers, but we also were not, they, they were not born so that um, we would be their BFFs either, right? I mean, we have to set limits. We have to um, say no occasionally. Um, and, and it's important to do so because kids need to know where the sidelines on the playing field are. Um, those kids who get in trouble and come to me with eating disorders or depression or substance use are often those kids whose parents were fairly permissive and did not give them clear signals on the way in the world. Okay. Well, this is more and more exciting because you're saying so many of the same things that I say. So I'm like, yeah, I'm validated. You just validated me, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Rich. Yay. Um, so, so one of the things, I, I did have a few questions, but we're running out of time. So um, some questions from the, the community, but I see that there's a question that popped up in the, uh, in the chat from somebody outside. And I think this is also something, uh, a question that a lot of people have expressed. And she said, um, I observed that my son started playing Minecraft with local friends during lockdown with great pleasure and a sense of connection has not started actually hanging out in person since lockdown. So how can I encourage pal parallel interactions on screen and in person? And the reason why I think this is such a good question is because, um, I mean, I really do believe this is something in September where we're going to want our children to continue those fabulous opportunities that they had online of, of educating, entertaining, networking, et cetera. But also, you know, do the parkour and go to theater and hang out with your friends at the mall or what have you. So um, um, I don't know who wants to um, answer to this. I'll probably say, you know, Dr. Rich, I'll look over at you. What do, what do you think? Okay. Well, um, I think what we have to do is, first of all, depending on what the rules in our community are, um, and they do vary. I mean, there's some communities that require face covering at all times outside, et cetera. Um, but to find equivalents, um, like I'll, I'll just use the example of my kids. I, we're in a community in Massachusetts that does require face coverings at all times outside. Um, so they do things like ride bikes with their friends. You know, um, you're six feet apart, you know, you can, uh, you, you can do that sort of thing. So find equivalents to those gaming environments um, out there in the big world. Um, uh, one place that's um, been fabulous for kids who would disappear in the um, prior to this uh, and are starting to open up again are maker spaces particularly for those kids who like Minecraft, my maker spaces are wonderful because they're basically um, a collection of things you can build um, from physically to electronically um, with a, a smart sort of mentor there. Um, and I've noticed that they've started to open back up again. And that, you know, that grabs their creativity, their imagination, and, you know, the, the sort of the gaming qualities um, of, of, of uh, Minecraft. Sorry. Okay. Um, so thank you. And actually, I'm going to just ask you one more kind of medical pediatric question, then I'm going to go to Laura. Um, I don't because this is from uh, Dr. Michelle McDonald in London in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's for children that have a range of neurodevelopmental de difficulties, how would you advise parents when gaming becomes part of their fixation? 
Um, this is a great question, Michelle. Um, you know, what, one of the things that we have to really um, discern is what aspects of that gaming are actually helping them and supporting them, and what are sort of rabbit holes that they can go down and di disappear into and, and, and not come out. Um, for example, a lot of kids who are on the autism spectrum um, really do quite well in, in, uh, in a, say, an environment like a, a tablet um, where they can interact with people where um, it's clear um, uh, what, what the meaning is of what's going on because they have a hard time reading people's you know, facial expressions and body language and things of that nature. So I, I don't think that it's all bad, but we have to do, it takes a little work to really determine what aspects of this particular application are helping my child and how can he or she transfer that into real life situations. So um, see it as a, not just a diversion for now, but as a stepping stone to, uh, to, to better things in, in the physical environment as well. Um, and, you know, we could go, I could go into great detail with specifics, but I think that that's the general fundamental thing is don't assume that it's a bad thing and don't assume that um, what may look you know, uh, as, like a distraction to a neurotypical kid, maybe to a kid with different neurodevelopmental needs, um, it may actually be a, a positive and adaptive environment. Okay, so then I think as we're, we're getting really, really close uh, to almost the end with like six more minutes, um, let's see, I think I'm gonna just take one more question. I know that we've been answering a few questions in the chat, so those um, should already be answered. I know that somebody did ask about um, the materials that Michael mentioned, and so of course I'll mention that again because now everybody wants your, your guide and they all wanna know about what the yayas are. Um, so, so let me ask another question here, um, and that is, um, with, with siblings of different ages, how do you determine what is the, the right age for certain games? And this is also something that we can see on Roblox uh, and something I'm sure, um, Michael, that you've seen as well because, you know, the kids are all excited about it and you've got, you know, the different ages doing different things. So really quickly, Laura, if you could just give me a one minute answer about how you handle that with Roblox and then I'll go to you, Michael. Um, so for us, the first thing is, if kids are under 13, we have a curated list of games that are suitable for anyone, whether they're 8 or 12. So I would suggest if they're kind of similar to age, that might be a good place to start. Um, younger kids are always going to want to follow their older siblings, and the older ones are not going to want them in that space. So that's more of an online, offline issue and something you're going to have to work out. So perhaps, again, building in some rules around that and saying you're allowed to play with older brother or whatever for an hour, but then they're allowed on their own or whatever the rules might be. Um, just again, it's about working out what's right for your kid. Every child is different, every family is different. Spend time to get to know the platform that they want to be on and give them some training. You know, we wouldn't just let kids go and get in a car with a set of car keys without some training. So I think just whatever the experience is and for whatever age, being there right at the beginning, walking through it with them, giving them that little bit of basic training, I think is absolutely essential. Okay, great. One minute. Michael, one minute. Um, absolutely. Um, and uh, I echo everything Laura says. And I, what I will say is, it's not an issue of age, it's an issue of the child. Um, at all, you know, you know, even the random age of 13 for social media, you know, there's some 10 year olds who can handle social media and some 23 year olds who can't. Um, and so I think the most important thing, uh, particularly when you have multiple kids of, of data is watch your kids using that game or that platform, whatever it is, and see how they respond to it. Make yourself available to them because if they run across things that confuse, upset, worry them, um, you can be there to both direct them, uh, you know, or respond to their concern, but also maybe direct them to other places if this is, you know, just a place that's scaring or upsetting them. So I think what's most important is that parental engagement we've been talking about from the beginning, which is not just um, screening things before your kid has it and um, or assuming that because it was good for one child when they were 10, it's gonna be good for another child when they were a kid. Every, every kid is different. So I think it's staying in touch with your child, keeping an open door for dialogue um, and observing them using the game, just like you would observe them 
using a power saw for the first time. Okay, great. And I still have three minutes, so I'm really going to get in before it. All my questions. Um, and so this is for both of you, um, just because we know that there's uh, inappropriate content, hate speech, uh, online hate. I mean, we see racism in, in gaming. So what specifically does Roblox do to keep some of this stuff out? And then for you, Michael, what can we do to help our children to, to, uh, with some of this? I know it's a big question for one minute, but I have faith that you can do it. Go, Laura. Thanks, I can. So we have a multi-layer approach to safety. So we have AI and machine learning running across the platform, picking up the kind of spam issues and bots and all of those sorts of things. We have a team of around 1,100 human moderators who are there responding to reports that come in. People can report in-game. They can also submit longer queries if they need to via the website. Um, we pre-moderate um, visual assets that are uploaded into games. So they are reviewed by a moderator before they're allowed to be live on the platform. Um, so we have a lot of these things running. We have really strict chat filtering. So we don't have any voice chat on the platform. Kids can type chat to each other. Um, and actually what we hear regularly from teenagers is it's way too restrictive, but we like it that way. Um, and so that, in a nutshell, that's what we do. Oh, and of course, working with safety partners like yourselves all over the world. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Michael, what about you? Some serious help for parents. How, what, can, what, can, what can we do? What would you tell me to tell my little boys when they see some of the crazy stuff that's online? What do we tell them? Talk, talk to them about that, but most importantly, listen to them about that. Mm -hmm. Hear what they are perceiving, what they are seeing. I mean, the average age, for example, for kids to get to pornography is now around nine. Um, right. Long before they are, you know, even struggling with their sexuality. And so it freaks them out. It weirds them out. Um, and instead of pretending it's not there or blocking, you know, Think, or thinking that they're technological block, um, remain open to them, remain a safe place and a nurturing place for them and, um, and, and make that part of your parenting. I mean, you have to parent in the digital space um, just as you parent in real life. And uh, remember that for a child, every moment is a teachable moment. And so that what they see, they will learn from. Um, and if it is something that you do not want them to learn, then it's your role to step in and give the counter story to say why this is not, you know, what is, is right. And, and I think that we will do best if we move it out of a values-based right and wrong, good and bad, appropriate, inappropriate, into a space of how am I affected by this experience? And do I want to be affected in that way? And being knowledgeable about ways in which we can be affected in pro-social, pro-health, pro Okay, so thank you so much. We are right at the hour and I've written down um, a few things. I hope that somebody, actually I know that it was recorded, but I hope that somebody was writing some of these things down because such kernels of wisdom. I mean, this is like my Instagram feed for the rest of the year, just listening to the wonderful things you guys were saying. So I've noted a couple of them. So parents don't miss out. You've had these children, don't miss out, go play. We need structure. We need to schedule, we need to play with our children. Uh, not so much rules, but expectations. And remember why we had them in the first place. And that is to play a little bit of Roblox with them. I'm telling you, go <laughs> do it, okay? So um, as we finish up this fabulous session, um, it has been recorded and it will be made available on FOSI's YouTube channel. Um, there'll also be circulating a recap of the event uh, via the email listing. So if you signed up, you will get that. And you will also get links to all of the materials that were mentioned. So Dr. Rich's um, well-being that is soon to be in French and Russian with all the yayas in there. And with, uh, <laughs> with Laura's Roblox uh, uh, um, survey and guide, and then a little note um, inviting you to my digital parenting community on Facebook. So I think that Emily is going to allow me to close out this session on my own like a big girl. I want to just <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for showing up. And thank you both for being so awesome and letting me like do my online safety Oprah bit with you. I bet you Fosi will have me back. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> thank you, guys. It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. All right, bye all. Go play.